discussing end of life issues. This is the Real Nurses Talk Show. Let's get started. <laughs> today uh, we're going to uh, discuss some of the issues that imp have to scale like nutrition um, advocacy advanced directives withdrawal of care and we're going to be talking about this using um, case studies that you are all very much aware of like the Terry Schiavo case a quote from a Washington Post article stated that enough people know firsthand that real-life angels and heroes work in palliative care medicine and hospice care so let's meet some of these real life angels and heroes on, on our panel today, shall we? Hi guys. Hi. So Hi. Welcome to the Real Nurses Talk Show. It's wonderful to have you here. Well, thank you. So on my right, uh, we have Tracy. Tracy, do you have a minute to just tell our audience? Sure. Who you are and what you do? My name is Tracy Calhoun and I have been a hospice nurse for 21 years. Oh my goodness. Between Washington State and Oregon and California. Um, I'm also a certified hospice and, and palliative care nurse, and I work down in Albany at our new inpatient hospice house facility. And uh, what's it? What's it called? Samaritan Evergreen Hospice. Okay, and that's inpatient then. We have inpatient and outpatient oh, care. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. And you came down from Washington. Thanks. Excited to have you here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Impala Nance. Mm -hmm. I am an RN. I'm currently working in the intensive care unit up in Seattle. Um, but I've been a nurse for about 10 years. I started out my career uh, in hospice, doing inpatient hospice and case management, and then transitioned into intensive care. Wonderful. So you guys have a lot of hospice experience, and uh, we're going to get started with the show. Can we um, go ahead and just define some terms so that mm -hmm. people would uh, be more familiar with what we're talking about? Sure. It is commonly stated that people at end of life need hospice care. Mm -hmm. um, what exactly is hospice care? What's involved in this? Who's in the team um, when you are in hospice? Um, hospice usually begins with a diagnosis of six months or less to live. Okay. And that's one of the ways that you can qualify for the benef this benefit through the government. Okay. So hospice is a benefit to the government? It is a part of it, yeah. Okay. So hospice care is just, it's terminal care. So you're still receiving treatment and it's more symptom management oriented instead of prolonging life. It's more about improving quality of life until the end. Okay. So mm -hmm. this is usually people we know are going to die like yeah. soon. Yeah. If their physician has said that they have a prognosis of most likely six months or less, mm -hmm. no one has a crystal ball, Right. Um, they are eligible to sign up, up with hospice, mm -hmm. okay. whether it's in the home whatever their home might be, okay. um, or inpatient for short stay for symptom management, there's okay. all sorts of benefit with the hospice mm -hmm. piece. Okay. Teams um, of nurses, social workers, the hospice physician, their own attending physician, mm -hmm. all sorts of volunteers, oh, um, hospice yeah. aides to help with care. Our yeah. therapy the home, dogs. And our therapy dogs. Yeah. <laughs> all sorts of things that, that can okay. be um, families and patients can pick and choose from for what mm -hmm. they need for their own quality of life. It also awesome. helps with getting equipment to your home or to wherever you need. So mm -hmm. if you need oxygen, if you need things to set up your shower, wheelchairs, anything like that, beds oh. for in the home, it's, a, it's a part of the benefit through okay. the government. And, and even though we're dealing with end of life, uh, mm -hmm. someone's dealing with a life ending diagnosis and the family is trying to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our whole focus about having hospice there is for their quality of life it's and trying right. to make those days that they have left the best that they Perfect. can have mm -hmm. and they get to choose what that is and tell mm -hmm. us, help guide us into what their care might be. Oh, that's excellent. Just the final, final phases of things, right, yeah. Phases Everything of comes to an end mm -hmm. and right. it's mm -hmm. kind of our job to make sure that that goes as well as possible and make it a wonderful experience for the families and Wonderful. make it what it can be. You know, okay. not, it doesn't need to be extremely traumatic. Okay. So. Wonderful. But different states of consciousness that people have. Um, p uh, people could be in a coma, uh, people, well, states of loss of consciousness. <laughs> 
uh, people could be in a coma, people could be in a uh, persistent vegetative state, or um, they could be declared brain dead. And we're gonna discuss some of this. Um, so before we talk about Terry Shriver, because she's the one that was in a persistent vegetative state, mm -hmm. we're just gonna have to explain to people a little bit about what um, the difference between coma and persistent vegetative state. So persistent vegetative state basically is typically if, if someone has um, not been responding, if it's persistent, it's been over a month, mm -hmm. but they no longer have the cognition functions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but their body can still do all sorts of reflexes. Um, right. They can maintain homeostasis. Like brain stem right. activity. Right. Mm -hmm. Which are like um, being able to breathe, things mm -hmm. you don't think right. about. Maintaining mm -hmm. blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Basic, Basic things heart, too. Cardiac. Like Function. Yeah, like with deep. things that you might see in babies, mm -hmm. so sucking and blinking exactly. and coughing, yeah. just yawning. reflexive things, right. yawning. Right. right. If you get poked, to kind of tense up. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And they will have the sucking reflexes, mm -hmm. um, just like Terry Shivo had some um, movement mm -hmm. of the eyes. It may be um, disorganized. We call that uh, disconjugate. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or it could be that they can actually track. So because they have that sort of partial consciousness, they're still alive because mm -hmm. the brain stuff is still working. We haven't, it's not defined its death yet, right? right? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so since we've been talking about persistent vegetative state, we're gonna go ahead and show you this a little clip of the Terry Schiavo um, story just to give you a refresher and then we're gonna discuss some of the issues that way, um, th that came up as a result of that clip. <laughs> Terry Schiavo's case started long before the cameras appeared. It was February of 1990 when the 26-year-old suffered a cardiac arrest. She went several minutes without oxygen from her collapse and um, experienced a profound brain injury. The first uh, couple days, doctors didn't know if she was going to live or die. Lack of oxygen left Schiavo with severe brain damage and in what doctors call a persistent vegetative state, or PVS a condition in which the parts of the brain that control thinking and awareness are damaged or destroyed. Only the brain stem, which controls basic reflexes like breathing, remains. Initially, Terry's husband and parents cared for her together, exploring potential treatments and rehabilitation. But four years after her collapse, Michael Schiavo says doctors gave him a grim prognosis. It was to a point where Terry wasn't going to function. There was nothing more, and they, and they told us her mother was sitting right there at the time. There was nothing more they can do for Terry. In 1998, Michael Schiavo petitioned to have his wife's feeding tube removed, saying she had told him and others she wouldn't want to live in this condition. Her parents, Bob and Mary Schindler, fought desperately to keep her alive, insisting that removing her feeding tube would be tantamount to murder. People think Terry was in a coma, she was brain dead. Uh, that she was terminal. Terry was not dying. Terry had a, a profound brain injury, and our family wanted to care for her just the way she was. With no living will expressing her wishes, it was up to the state courts to decide Terry's fate. They went to court more than anybody has ever gone to court, in my experience, in fighting about an end-of-life care case. This was probably the most litigated case that I can think of. We were up and down the federal court system, the state court system, many, many times. At least 19 judges heard the case through various appeals, and the decisions were all ultimately in Michael Schiavo's favor, going back to the original court ruling that said that there was clear and convincing evidence that Terry would not want to be kept alive and that her feeding tube should be removed. She told me what she wanted, and the courts heard it over and over and over again. For Terry's parents, the legal decisions were devastating. The appeal to the media and the public. Please, please, please save my little girl. They became a cause. They got picked up by talk radio. They had religious groups weighing in on their behalf. Spare this innocent child. It was a fear across the board of euthanasia, assisted suicide, abortion, and abandonment of the disabled, if you will. That's what a lot of the motives were that drove those who rallied to the side of Terry's parents. To deliberately starve her to death is an act of cruelty and ultimately it's murder itself. Terry touched a nerve with so many people because 
and they saw a family that was willing and wanting to care for her, they didn't understand why they weren't being allowed to do that. On both sides, emotions ran high. No one would want to live this way. 20 times in court, 20 times. This is the Roe versus Wade of euthanasia. I used to say, what are these people doing? Why tarry? People's feeding tubes are removed every day. To this day, I don't know why, but it was very surreal. Should Terry Schiavo live or die? What evidence is there that this woman has any brain function or not? Michael Schiavo believes the media fanned the flames, especially after the Schindlers released a series of videos that they said proved Terry was conscious and aware. But Kaplan says the videos were misleading. It was irresponsible beyond belief that it was run unchallenged and unexamined. It was too attractive to the media not to use. Here she is. But it was assembled selectively, and it was staged, and it did not indicate what she could do. Kaplan says that what looked like intentional responses in Terry were just reflexes that are common in people in a persistent vegetative state. A lot of our bodily systems are run off that part of the brain that Terry still had. That tape used that fact and made it look as if she was thinking and feeling. While most of the doctors who examined Shivo believed she was in a vegetative state, not everyone in the medical community agreed. There's a total of about 14 specialists in brain injury and stroke, uh -huh. which is her situation, who have come out to point out that she's not in PVS, not in a coma, does respond, is alert, and actually has even the ability to communicate. With each side entrenched, arguments turn to threats. It's no fun getting up in the morning and looking under your car before you start the engine to see if there's a de device because you've had people contact you saying that they're gonna blow you to bits if you keep working on this case. My house is invaded day in and day out. And these are people pushing their views on me. And I don't, I don't understand that. You have your view on things and you have your beliefs on, that's great, but don't stand outside somebody else's house and push that on them. And the more the fight played out in public, the more political it became. Who's going to look out for this girl's rights? We have to. In 2003, Florida legislators passed Terry's Law, which gave Governor Jeb Bush the authority to reattach Shivo's feeding tube. The tube had been removed by court order six days earlier. We did what was right, and I'm proud of the legislature for responding. The state law was eventually found to be unconstitutional, but in 2005, the fight moved to Capitol Hill. There are extraordinary events happening in Washington tonight as the U.S. Congress and President move toward passing a law before morning to intervene in the case of Terry Schiavo. By then, Schiavo's feeding tube had been removed again. If we do not act, she will die of thirst. Conservative lawmakers led the charge to pass a law that would give Terry's parents the chance to continue their fight in federal court. These are extraordinary circumstances that center on the most fundamental of human values and virtues, the sanctity of human life. Opponents argued that politicians had no place interfering in personal medical decisions. Do we really want to insert ourselves in the middle of families' private matters all across America? This Congress should respect the law and the rulings of courts and not trample the Constitution. After a late night emergency session of Congress, for the relief of the parents of Teresa Marie Schiavo, the bill came to a vote. 203 yeas, 58 nays. The bill is passed, and without objection, the motion reconsiders laid upon the table. The bill was then rushed over to President Bush, who signed it after midnight. But the law wasn't enough. A federal judge refused to order the feeding tube reinserted because he found the arguments were unlikely to succeed in federal court. The Schindler family kept appealing to no avail. And on March 31st, 2005, the long, painful public struggle was over. The end came this morning for Terry Schiavo and her husband's lawyer says she died peacefully 13 days after her feeding tube was removed. Terry, we love you dearly but we know that God loves you more than we do. We must accept your untimely death as God's will. Shivo's autopsy eventually confirmed what had been so hotly contested for years in court proceedings. The damage to her brain had been massive and irreversible, 
Bobby Schindler says the extent of her injuries wouldn't have made a difference to his family. I think it's important to also understand that none of this mattered to my family in this battle. It didn't matter to us um, if Terry never improved from her condition. We loved her unconditionally. We loved her that way. The family of a little girl left on life support after tonsil surgery goes horribly wrong gets a really powerful ally. Today, Schindler and his family remain in the public eye. They run a nonprofit in Terry's memory to help families facing similar issues. We have a team put together and we're doing everything we can to get you high out of the situation with the hospital. In one way or another, Terry Schiavo's plight continues to leave a mark on the nation. It inspired an initial increase in living wills and advanced directives just after she died. And in 2007, she ranked just below Mother Teresa and Oprah on a list of people who moved us most in the last quarter century. I think the country have learned something. I hope they say, remember the Terry Schiavo story. What do you want me to do if something happens to you? And I'm hoping that's Terry's legacy. So now she's at peace. She has what she wanted. And as her gravestone says at the bottom, I kept my promise. We're back. Thanks for staying with us. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, the Terry Schiavo case pointed out a few things that we'll need to address today, right? Like hydration and nutrition, and of course, um, issues with particular legislative state. So we want to talk about the nutrition part at end of life. Well, how is the body addressing food at end of life? Not well. Okay. <laughs> so as, as bodies are slowing down, no matter how the nutrition might be getting into you, mm -hmm. if you have tube feeding, because we have to deal with that in hospice and yeah. end of life, um, people who might have had some kind of tube feeding and, and for whatever reason they couldn't swallow. Okay. Um, as, your bo as our bodies are slowing down, it just doesn't process food. Okay. Our people who can eat mm -hmm. choose you know, they, they say they don't have an appetite, their appetite goes away, it's one mm -hmm. of the first signs, and they just stop voluntarily eating. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that actually happens that we can check on mm -hmm. our patients mm -hmm. uh, who have a tube feeding is we can check residuals. Mm -hmm. okay. And time after time will happen as their bodies are slowing down, their disease is taking over, their body physically is no longer tolerating all of that food. So yeah. you're having big residuals where people yeah. are vomiting yeah. and aspirating. aspirating. Yeah. And I see that all the time, and it's something we talk about with our families who have somebody with tube feeding. As yeah. time goes on, this is what to expect, and this is why we're checking all these things. This is why we're asking these okay. things. Mm -hmm. And those are some of the roles that nurses play. So you mentioned aspirating, and I'm pretty sure that lots of people out there don't mm -hmm. know what that means. Um, yep. So could you just... So one of the things that can happen is is um, you can aspirate, which means you inhale food or fluid into your lungs. Um, the, the tube that goes down to your lungs is right next to the one that goes down to your stomach. Mm -hmm. And often the valve that covers that just doesn't do a very good job okay. at the end of life. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so people can vomit and it can, instead of throwing up like we would do, mm -hmm. um, it can go slide right back down into the lungs. Right, yeah. and then that will cause pneumonia and other issues and yeah. then trauma to the tooth. And I think too when people are having, you know, they have an acute illness that they're dying from, yeah. like in intensive care, mm -hmm. if we try to force people to eat, it doesn't go anywhere because right. the body's kind of shunting the vital yeah. processes to keep the heart and to keep the brain going and it shuts everything else down right. below here. So you'll right. start to see the renal failure and exactly. liver failure and then the backup of all the fluids and all that comes from that. Right. And so forcing the issue is not always the best the decision. Best. Yeah, because right. the body is kind of telling you that it's tired right. and it's done. Mm -hmm. Right. And right. Mm -hmm. um, so um, one of the things that I wondered about just watching, I was thinking advanced directives would, make, would have made such a big difference Huge. in that case. Mm -hmm. um, so um, first of all, we want to explain what an advanced directive is. Advanced directives just is basically you're telling us what you want to have done when you face the end of your life. Okay. And 
I would recommend everybody to have it no matter what your age Early. is or mm -hmm. what's going on unless Absolutely. because you don't want to have yeah. some random hospital person making decisions for you right. or you want to be able to elect a family member that you trust right. to say that these are the things that you want and these are the things that you don't want when you're not able to make decisions. Right. And then you need to talk to your family members mm -hmm. about what you want and make, and it, make very it very clear. Specific right. And very and clear. And one thing I find that it helps families make that decision about which going to and not feel guilty right. mm -hmm. because people start thinking that they are they're basically killing that person because they mm -hmm. are saying okay take away mm -hmm. the, the breathing machine or stop treating them mm -hmm. and but if you have an advanced directive it does free them of some of that guilt because then they are they are doing what you want they, right. are, do, they mm -hmm. are following your wishes and so that's one of the reasons why it's very important to have that too mm -hmm if not for yourself, for your family mm -hmm. um, in that situation. Right. Yeah, and it's not uncommon for mm -hmm. people who are younger to think, oh, I don't need to think about that, but, right. but, but you things don't happen mm -hmm. all exactly. the time. You don't expect to get in a car accident exactly. or to have a hiking, something happen. It right. just, sometimes things just happen. And I always try to explain DNR to people are very afraid when they hear the do not resuscitate, that that means that they're gonna have to go off in some corner and just be left alone to right, rot away, right. and it doesn't mean that at all. Right. It, you'll still get all kinds of treatment. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll still get your pain taken care mm -hmm. of. You'll still get your nausea or whatever your mm -hmm. issues are taken care of. It just means that we're not going to aggressively jump on you and start mm -hmm. pounding Being on your chest exactly. and shocking you and doing all these things to force your body to stay alive. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so sometimes that might be the more, depending on what your situation is, mm -hmm. that might be the wiser choice. Right. Right which is why having the hospice discussion early mm -hmm. is really beneficial. Absolutely. So we don't get to the point where somebody is in an ICU mm -hmm. and what we, we, we can't really do anything to help. So if they had made Along the way. decision a lot earlier mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. that I wanna be comfortable and this is what I want, then you know they wouldn't even get to that point. Right, and you know with the Terrier Shriver case, tying it back to a discussion, mm -hmm. um, if she had had an advance directive and she had written had it written down that she did not want to stay in that state mm -hmm. um it it might have helped her family cope with the fact that her husband um was advocating for right. her wishes right. because there was nothing written mm -hmm. yes. so it made it very hard and it's hard because you don't want to go against your family mm -hmm. but just have it written down absolutely yeah, yeah. absolutely and explain mm -hmm. why you would want what things you want. a certain way mm -hmm. right um if we withdraw food, um, like in her case, they decided that they didn't want to do the feeding tube anymore. Mm -hmm. um, if that is your wish, or if a family member decides that mm -hmm. this is what we need to do for someone we do not have an advance directive, um, is that the same as starving them to death? As their body is slowing down, no. Okay. Um, mm -mm. I don't think so either, because mm -hmm. if you have no brain function, then what is your life, I guess? Is right. That's just the way that I feel about it. Right. I mean, if you're just a machine being fed and cleaned and wiped and bathed and you don't have any sense of consciousness or sense of self, right. then why would you continue doing that? Right, right. Especially if that was that person's wish. Especially, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So why do you think it's so difficult for families <laughs> to deal with the fact that, um, you know, we, we can withdraw um, feeding someone at end of life? Why is that such a difficult thing? Because food is comfort. Mm -hmm. Think food of any time you have a problem, what does your family do? You, you get fed. What or is a the celebration. Anything. Or a wait. You're always right. eating. We always eat. It's yeah. very, very difficult to not have that anymore and right. just to allow things to go as they are going right. naturally and it's also hard people put themselves in that position mm -hmm. thinking I would be so hungry I would be so thirsty I can't imagine going without but their body is not slowing down and shutting down mm -hmm. it, so you can't really imagine that but yeah. it's, it's really difficult for them and they yeah. need a lot of um, guidance and coaching and support just mm -hmm. around all those feelings yeah. Right. The next situation we are going to be discussing is that of uh, Jihai Mat Matmat. Um, this was a young lady, as you may remember, who went in to get a routine tonsillectomy done and ended up brain dead. Um, it took a few days, but that was the final result. And this, this was 
this became newsworthy because the family um, did not want the breathing treatment to be withdrawn, but the hospital w ins was insistent on it. And so we want to discuss that because if you're a family member and you're in that kind of situation, mm -hmm. uh, we want people to be able to differentiate uh, between someone having a heartbeat and someone being dead. Like what are the legal criteria for um, declaring somebody legally dead, especially here in I the I US? I don't know, I think sometimes when it's a shocking situation like mm -hmm. that, they're people just aren't ready for it and they're not ready mm -hmm. to let especially their daughter right. they're not going to be ready to let their daughter go right. but if she's having seizures and she's got no response like when they do an EEG she's mm -hmm. got no brain activity right. and she could have been having heart attacks I mean I'm not a hundred percent sure about her case but right. to keep her intubated and on a ventilator to just prolong things is is rather torturous right. I mean if there's no hope that she's going to wake up and she's just going to continue to suffer right I mean there's nothing to wake her from she's already has zero electrical activity zero right? electrical activity yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and um, I just wanted to say that uh, legally there are two ways that we um, we can define death in the United States and uh, one of them we see a lot in the hospital, which is the brain death. If we do that EEG and we see there's no electrical activity, mm -hmm. the brain is completely, the lights are out. The brain, mm -hmm. there's no activity, so then you're legally dead. And that's, that's how we define death. And the other way, and it's the way that people are so, um, are much more um, familiar with. And I think that's why they get really confused. Mm -hmm. um, it's because it's the cessation of all circulatory and respiratory function. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you were at home or if you, if you were not on a mission, for example, your heart stopped, you stop breathing, mm -hmm. we say you're dead. Mm -hmm. And that's what people understand, that's what people know, that's what we see on TV. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so people are very familiar right. with that version of um, declaring someone dead. But what they don't understand, and I think this is something that I would really like um, the show to impart on people, is that brain death supersedes that mm -hmm. um, if someone if someone is globally gone if someone's dead mm -hmm. there is nothing there to support mm -hmm. there's nobody there and even legally that would be the the ultimate way we would define mm -hmm. that okay I guess it just begs the question what is life to you is right. life the beating of your heart and that's it is life um, you're blinking right. is life a hunger pain or right. is it the feelings you have emotions you have connections with people, right. um, right. critical thinking, anything like that. So what right. is it? Is it really just, you're just a machine functioning or right. is it the makeup of all of these different things? Right. And I think that's what um, makes it hard because say that person had a heartbeat. I mean, you come into the patient's room, we, we say this all the time, mm -hmm. and you know, the ventilator, they can see the rise and fall of the chest and they're mm -hmm. thinking that person's breathing. They look up at the monitors, right. they mm -hmm. see, see the a rhythm. Mm -hmm. They think, there is a heartbeat, mm -hmm. what are you telling me? Right. This person is gone, you can't mm -hmm. say they're dead when I can see all this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you could hear that from the family's voice, you could see just how frustrated they were. Mm -hmm. And that's when our um, advocacy comes in, right? And that's mm -hmm. when you know helping patients and families deal with death comes in, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So can you go a little bit into how nurses help families grieve and what our role is at that end of life process when someone's going? Yeah, yeah, in the intensive care unit, a lot of times I will just try to redirect their hope. Instead of maybe hoping that the person will wake up, why don't you hope that they remain comfortable and that things happen the way that they're supposed to happen okay. and that it goes as well as it can for that patient, okay. whatever the outcome may be. Okay. Because cure and waking up and being normal like they were before may not be an option. And so I just try to redirect the focus onto that. And so let's just do what we can with the situation that we have right now. Nobody ever intended for this to happen and nobody was ready for this to happen, but this right. is what it is. It is what it is. It is what it is. And with that, folks, uh, we have come to the end of the first part of this show. We're hoping that you have uh, learned something about um, end of life treatments and we are going to go into physician assisted suicide and a few other things on our next show. So um, you will be seeing this most likely next week. Uh, so stay tuned. This has been Sunday Justice on the Real Nurses Talk Show. Goodbye. <laughs>